impact full marketing channel. I'm originally from South Africa, where I worked agency side, an agency called Pomegranate that mostly worked with nonprofits, and I led their kind of their social media and their email marketing teams. Um, when I moved to the UK, I became head of marketing for Donor, who are the kind of text giving provider, and they also offer kind of other online giving services now. And I led their new kind of product strategy and rebrand in 2018. And by the time I left in 2020, we'd raised um, over half a million pounds for UK charities. So my very first freelance client was Fundraising Everywhere. And I ran their kind of social media and the email program. And now I work with organizations big and small on projects like email strategy, copywriting, automated stewardship and MailChimp training. So today's session is all about kind of like the, the key fundamentals that I think we need to really get right as a sector, particularly as um, culture, arts and heritage organizations to turn our email programs into part of kind of our marketing and our fundraising mix, like, you know, a channel that really builds community and drives results. But before we kind of do the tactical side of things, I thought we could start with the numbers. So these stats are from the brand new 2023 MNR benchmark study that just came out last week. And on average, a charity email subscriber will receive 23 emails per year. So that's more or less broken down into six fundraising messages, three advocacy alerts, five newsletters and then like the rest is all just kind of made up made up of kind of miscellaneous emails I think it's really important to note that in the study um, they noted that non-UK organizations that took part would receive 29 fundraising emails alone so that really big distinction in volume um, it's primarily organizations in the states and whilst I do think that maybe our friends over in the US have potentially a higher threshold for email, I really just want you to kind of keep that difference in volume in the back of your mind for this talk. Then in terms of revenue, you know, what's one of the reasons why, you know, we really have to pay attention to it as a channel. Um, so in 2022, for every 1,000 fundraising email sent, UK nonprofits raised 66 pounds. This is a drop from 2021. But it is also really important to note that this um, statistic is the median. Um, and it's also important to note that not all organizations experience a drop in email. So for large nonprofits, the average email revenue was 160% higher in 2022 than it was in 2021. And kind of in terms of return, I'd also really like you to take a moment to think about how much you might raise per organic Facebook post, per kind of, let's say 1000 followers, for example. And the reason that I like to frame it like that is there are so many platforms for us to be on as organizations. There's so many changes happening all the time. And email has remained largely unchanged for the last 10 years. And I think that it makes it, well, it makes us kind of feel like it's part of our to-do list and we only really lean on it for certain types of communications. But if we look at organic return of other digital channels, it, um, it's, it really is, you can really kind of start to see the, the benefit of email and the kind of the potential ROI if we invest in our email programs in the right kind of way. Um, in terms of kind of how, what percentage of online revenue email is generating, in 2021, it accounted for 4% of all online revenue for UK nonprofits. And in, for 2022, that percentage has dropped to just 2%. And you might think it's a little bit weird that I'm bringing this up in the beginning of the talk because the whole point of our time together is for me to kind of get you excited about email. But the reason why I bring this up is that, you know, in the US over the past two years, email revenue accounted for 20% of online revenue. And so if you have a think about kind of income distribution in your own organizations, 
what would it mean for your work if you easily quadrupled your um, income generated via email? Um, and you know, what would the impact of that be? And this links back to kind of what I was saying before, kind of keeping that volume piece in your mind. You can really start to see that when we send more really good emails, which I'll talk a bit more about now, the, the income and the fundraising potential of our email programs becomes so much bigger. So what does kind of 23-ish emails look like a year? So I'd whack up some post-its. Because um, sometimes when you say, you know, subscribers and our community are receiving between kind of 23 and 28 emails a year, immediately, I think sometimes like our visceral reaction is that's loads. But if we're just kind of sending some sporadic general newsletters kind of every now and again, and then dropping in some events emails for things that we've got coming up in the summer, there may be an emergency appeal because that almost kind of feels like standard operating procedure for us at the minute as a sector and then still kind of slap dashing those general newsletters a bit in the summer for when we have time and then we take a break because we assume everyone else has taken a break and then we kind of get to November and December and we rely really heavily on email for our big give appeals for pushing um year end events and kind of our big fundraising appeals as well so when you kind of look at it like that and you see that total number of emails, but to me, if I look at what else I'm getting in my inbox, especially from, you know, the frequency of from for-profit brands, um, I think, you know, that it really doesn't feel like a really big number. But there's a but here. Let's say your open rate is kind of between 30 and 40 percent for general kind of email comms, which is a really good rate and you don't really segment your email comms and you also don't really send timely automated stewardship. If you're emailing a subscriber kind of let's say 23 to 28 times a year, your engaged readers are only hearing from you eight times a year. And so combine you know, that and how much of a relationship can you build when someone's you know potentially only receiving 10 touch points from you in a year and you're not regularly cleaning your email data your email file and therefore kind of your email community is essentially dying so how do you create a thriving program for your organization um i always like to start the section with the rather you know, really dramatic kill the newsletter um, and if you have you know any questions about newsletter formatting etc please drop them in the q and a and we'll chat about it afterwards um, but i do think that generally as as a whole the sector is still really stuck in the whole like monthly let's squish everything into one email like events programming, fundraising, stories, appeals, like all in one. And that kind of approach as a whole results in lower click through rates and overall kind of lower, like lower engagement. And I do think that there's a lot to be said for the language that we use internally. And I actually think that calling our regular email comms newsletters can harm our creativity and harm our readers' experience. And I think by calling something a newsletter, it often means that we fall into the trap of creating really, what can often feel quite generic because you're squishing so much in, so you don't ever feel like you can really like get into a story. Um, and, you know, formats and tones and things that are often quite, you know, really repetitive. And over time, that causes your average reader to switch off. So think about how you approach your own inbox. Um, we all do it where you go in the morning and you go and check your promotions folder or whatever it might be. And you go, oh, it's, it's, it's these people again. I know exactly what it's going to be. And I don't, I don't really have 
time for it. It doesn't excite me in any kind of way. And we just do that like select all and mass delete. Um, or kind of worse yet, if if that content experience really isn't very good, then people also, if it's not easy to unsubscribe, um, people will mark you as spam, which is really harmful for your email deliverability overall. So what should we we do instead kind of for our newsletter? I'm um, a really big, like one of the, the core beliefs of maybe later is that, you know, we don't think that email and marketing strategy and like tactical execution should be overly complicated if it doesn't have to be. Because often when we overcomplicate things with big elaborate plans and theories, like we've got other stuff going on. And with, you know, even though we can have, all have the best intentions in the world, it then becomes something that we don't implement. So often my first kind of starting point for your newsletter is to, you know, I talk to teams and I say, what would happen if you called it something else internally? Your supporters can maybe still know it as a newsletter because it's a turn of phrase that we're all really familiar with. But what happens to your email comms and how does it change if you simply called your emails and your kind of your content plan and your content strategy, like your weekly emails or your monthly emails? What happens if you give your newsletter a particular name and you really start to treat that regular emailing? like a creative, like a really creative project and process. Um, if, if you're like me and you like a little bit of structure kind of for your planning, I think this is also kind of where maybe using like content buckets or email types to plan your email content becomes really useful. You know, so it could range from really broadly, like, you know, events or special interests or community stories. You can start to bring in maybe kind of like awareness days or things that are kind of happening in the broader community. And you can already see from making that really small change that if you went and looked at your email planning for the next three months, instead of just having a calendar slot that said newsletter, and it was, you know, it was more, it lent into kind of maybe like a content type, it was just a weekly newsletter, you know, and you started to plan things out that way. How does that change the content and the experience? Um, what space does that create for you to try different formats, sending emails from different voices or perspectives in your organization? Um, and I just think it means that when we're not sending our fundraising up throughout the year, that we're then creating an email experience and we're building a relationship over email in a way that makes it much more likely for, for people to take action when we ask them kind of further down the line. But there are also kind of four other main points that I think we really need to pay attention to if we want to build kind of thriving email programs for our organizations. So those are your email data acquisition strategy. You also need to be looking at automation, personalization and optimization. So if I go to the email data acquisition kind of strategy piece of the puzzle, like we all know that list churn is really normal and to keep our email files consistent or better yet growing, we need to have clear strategies that run throughout the year that are all about growing our email lists. And I think that there are a couple of really interesting things that we can start to look at to kind of build out that acquisition strategy piece. So the first is that I really want you to go and have a look at optimizing your donation form opt-in statements. Subscribe for updates is not enough, I don't think. Um, subscribe to stay up to date with the impact of your gift is not enough. We, again, like think about your own inbox and how busy it is. Even if I'm really invested in a, a cause or a particular kind of organization, in a moment when I'm going through that, that donation process, my I'm deciding based on the information that's being given to me, is it 
is it worth it to let this brand and this voice take up space in my inbox? And so by optimi optimizing our opt-in statements and to like, you know, really make them enticing and let our brand and our kind of our tone of voice shine, I think you can really see um, kind of an uptick in conversion rates there to opt into your marketing. Then we know that paid social is obviously a really big part of our acquisition strategies these days. Um, and we've we see a lot of really interesting values driven campaigns. Um, I really do think that the experts in that um, are forward action. You don't necessarily have to be a campaigning or an advocacy organization for those types of campaigns to work. It's just about tapping into what your supporters care about and what they value. So that's really worth exploring. Um, I love I love watching charities really kind of tap into like quizzes and games to help grow their acquisition strategy. There are so many free and really affordable tools out there to help you build these processes and they're all code free. Um, and I think we're going to see so much more of that coming up and being really accessible with AI. So it just means that you don't have to have that really heavy technical background to make that piece happen. And then a thing that I think like a, a tool or a process that I think particularly, you know, creative organizations such as yourselves can really take advantage of, um, and a lot of for-profit um, organizations do it, is looking at kind of an email course model. So effectively, all that is, is an automated series of emails, kind of usually between three and five emails, where an organization teaches a particular kind of skill or gives more information on a particular kind of area of interest. And you all as organizations and kind of, and as fundraisers, the organizations that you work for, you are so rich with information and, and experience and expertise and people want to learn from you. And I think it's a really brilliant way to flip the kind of generic lead magnet script on its head. I also think that we need to put a much bigger emphasis on kind of our, our general kind of email comms, so that newsletter piece, as it were. And again, I think we should be taking a page out of um, for-profit brands books here who now really treat their email subscribers, so, you know, the ones who have come directly from subscribing via a link on their link tree or via their website, really kind of as like as as VIPs as almost an inner circle and I think often we reserve that level of communication and community for regular givers but I think if we can take some of those 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 things that we that we do really well in fundraising and apply it to our kind of our more general email stewardship I think we'd see a much bigger return I'd also it's a really simple one, but I think it gets overlooked a lot of the time. Go and make sure that you have a separate URL to promote that general kind of email community. We all know that they live on the footer, but it just means that it becomes much easier to share on social media. But also then you can really start to test interesting things, you know, like um, a, a QR sign up kind of code and any physical spaces that you might have. And then again, you know, it's that opt-in statement. So it's not just about, you know, subscribing to get updates about our work and our community. You know, what do people get for being part of your, of your email community and for letting you into their inbox? Um, and you can really kind of, you can start to build or ensure that kind of that steady trickle of new subscribers. And also kind of on, on the general kind of email note, I think it's also really, really important to pay attention to how you welcome those new subscribers, which brings me on to point two, automation. And, you know, automated stewardship by email generates 80% more donations and costs one third to produce than sporadic one-off email campaigns. Like that, like it's massive. But I think because in our minds, we feel like they're, they can be really resource heavy to plan and create, and often the tech can feel really accessible, that it's, that it's a job that we put off. 
because there is that quite big kind of initial like cost sink as it were, but it is 100% worth it. Um, and kind of starting kind of from a general automation kind of standpoint, I think one of the biggest rooms for experimentation and growth, particularly for um, sort of cultural and creative organizations such as yourselves, is the automated welcome journey for those general email subscribers who aren't donors yet. Like those people, they're incredibly story driven. And, you know, they've taken an action, a non-monetary action that tells you explicitly that they want your brand and your voice and your work in one of their most precious digital spaces, their inbox. And, you know, I think it's our job to use automated email and, and storytelling to delight them. But on that point, though, we really have to get better at lessening the time between when someone signs up and on donations and then the data imports and then trigger organizations. I mean, and there's, there's kind of that storytelling. I know that a lot of organizations are like data lives in one place, comms lives in another, and it's not always integrated. So I'd say to really get value for money for your automation, you know, and the time that you put into it, make sure that that automated importing is happening. Um, that obviously creates a much better experience for our supporters and for our readers, because, you know, when there's, there's a stat around, I think, you know, 75% of people expect an automated welcome email as soon as they sign up. So it has a much higher open rate. It has a much higher click through rate. Um, I can, you know, almost guarantee that it will be one of the highest performing emails that you ever send. And if you can capture people's attention and imagination over a series, I think you do much better to increase their kind of their long term engagement. Um, yeah, over time. But then also on a more technical note, that level, that engagement, getting people to take actions and emails, that's over time what really improves your email deliverability. So that keeps you out of spam folders, the updates or the promotions tab. And so by long-term focusing kind of on that automation piece, you're also ensuring kind of the overall health of your email database. I wish I could give you an exact list of the automations that you need to be focusing on, but I can't. Um, and I do feel like your automation to-do list should really be informed by data segmentation and the data that you collect about your subscribers and your supporters, which brings me on to point three, which is personalization. So as a sector, we know that we need to move beyond just segmenting and personalizing based on demographic data and donation history, but we still don't do it. And I think that personalization in terms of email needs to live both in your automation strategy as well as kind of your single sends. So for automations like donation stewardship in particular, I'd really love to see more organizations start to branch their automated email stewardship really early on. So if you let's say, for example, collect reason for giving, I'd say that it's much better to send one generic kind of welcome email to all of your donors and then to immediately start to segment based on their reason for giving. Because the types of stories, the tone that you can use, the type of, you know, the content that you can share can, it can become just so much more nuanced and more personal when you start to feed in why people have donated what kind of motivates them, what they're interested in. Um, and then, you know, over time, that means that, again, those subscribers stay engaged for much longer. And so then when it, we come to ask them to become a regular giver or potentially leave a gift in will, you know, from the get-go, they associate a lot of the comms that they receive from you as something, you know, that's really, that's personal and that you really care about them. Um, and also kind of personalization in terms of single sends, I think should really be informed by like behavior in previous emails. So 
all most of the platforms make it really easy to build segments around if someone did or didn't open a previous email or if they clicked on a particular image or a particular call to action style you know start to personalize emails based on that but then again you know a really fun creative part of the puzzle is paying attention to subscriber interests so collecting this data doesn't mean that you can only contact people about one area of your work this is obviously gdpr wording kind of often dependent so always check that with um, your internal gdpr person but you can run you know sporadic one-off campaigns throughout the year to segments of your audience to find out what they're interested in you can also pull in if you you've got kind of ticket purchase data or donation data based on if there was a particular kind of exhibition on you can really start to pull in that information and work those different sort of subscriber interests into your general email planning and if you think back to kind of like the the overall number of emails and that volume if we want to look at kind of increasing the number of emails that we send like it's really important to remember that we don't have to email everyone all of the time and I think sometimes it can be really easy to be like oh we're only sending this email to 200 people so it's not worth it but if we know that it's it's kind of it's highly personalized and we know that that engagement rate is going to be much higher and we get 70% of those people to open those emails and those are stats that I have you know seen in campaigns that I've um, worked on myself and then you have a conversion rate of 20% to go on and to take that fundraising action those throughout the year that is is 100% kind of worth the effort and then kind of finally that optimization piece that refers to like both our content and our email data and you know content wise we really need to be doing regular ab testing i think we need to be running tests in at least 50% of our campaigns start really simply that's you know subject line variations test different images different call to action styles and tracking the findings of these tests does not have to be complicated and um, your email marketing platforms should let you export that data in kind of csv format it should also um, depending, you know, depending on what you use as a dashboard that make, gives makes it really clear for you who the winner was, what to text, test next. All of these platforms are bringing in so much AI so quickly. And I wouldn't be surprised if in kind of the next six to 12 months, you have tools that would say, right, okay, the winner was A, here's what we think you should test next. And they'll just give you kind of those ideas. It is really important to note though, that we only get value from our A-B testing if we have the time to review the data and then work the findings into upcoming campaigns as well as kind of figure out what to test next. This reflection time, especially in email, isn't a nice to have, it is a necessity. And then kind of Lastly, that optimization piece, you know, op around kind of optimizing your data. This is the bit, especially if you're a creative, that can feel feel a little boring, but it is really important. And it's all around kind of consistently cleaning your email data. So clean data directly impacts email deliverability. And a, a US nonprofit report found that 61% of nonprofits emailed subscribers regardless of their engagement. And I really wouldn't be surprised if we were at about kind of the same level in the UK. And so what do we actually need to do to, to optimize our email database? We need to be actively removing bounces and unsubscribes. This can feel really scary, I think, when you're, you you want to maintain the size of particularly, let's say like your individual giving email file, but removing bounces and unsubscribes, you know, there's a, there's a GDPR part for unsubscribes, so bounces are not receiving them anyway. So just get rid of them. But then kind of the second piece of the puzzle is that we also really need to remove um, in 
um, inactive subscribers. So we don't just remove them off the bat. You really need to look at running re-engagement campaigns. So finding that segment of subscribers who are cooling off and then trying to get them basically warmed up again. So that's all about getting them to take an action in an email. It can be as simple as click here if you still want to hear about whatever it is that you do. Um, just, yeah, it's normally a really short email. The subject lines are really like, we're, we're sad to see you go. Do you still want to hear from us? Do you still care about X? And if they haven't kind of, if you haven't been able to reactivate them after like a certain number of attempts, it is again better to get rid of that data because that improves your deliverability. And wouldn't it be awful if you put all of this time into personalization and this brilliant content plan and then people who really want to receive your emails aren't receiving them because your overall email health isn't where it should be. And if you're actively kind of removing those subscribers, if you've got your email data acquisition strategy in place, back to point one, your file is still staying consistent and all growing. So you're absolutely fine. So why should we invest more in email? Um, I don't know about you. I love a great concise list to kind of make a case for support and or even just to tell myself when I've got so many things to do, this is why I need to be paying attention to this. We know that the ROI from automated stewardship is, is incredibly high. Um, we also need to be paying attention to the death of cookies. So the first phase out of cookies in for Gmail users and kind of across other platforms happening Q1 of next year, and there's more to follow. We've already seen changes with Meta. And so we really need to focus on building our own first party data strategies and your email database is the only marketing community that you own. I also had to put in little brackets there that um, Mark and Elon are also about to wrestle, i.e. social media is really unstable at the moment. Do we still tweet? Do we X? What do we do now? Yeah. And I, again, I always ask people to think about, you know, if your social media pages disappeared tomorrow, what state is your email community in? to mobilize and engage supporters. And then kind of some more fun ones. I, like, I firmly believe, and that's, I'm so passionate about it, that email, especially automation, really protects your capacity and your team's capacity. And I think we need to be doing everything that we can right now to prevent more burnout in the sector. And acknowledging that our teams and our departments are made up of humans who cannot turn up at 100% all the time is part of that. And our automations and our automated stewardship help us give a 100% experience to supporters, even when we can't. Whether that's because we're focusing on a different big appeal or at school holidays or, you know, whatever it might be. And then, like, finally, on a positive note, Email creates so much room to test and play both within email and other marketing channels. Um, and I think because we're all creative people here, you know, the room that we can we can play and we can try different formats and send times and add in different design elements. I think it's what can make email and our marketing as a whole really exciting. I don't push for time, so I'm trying to be quick. I'm nearly done. So where to from here i i want to be really bold and say that i think the best advice for a lot of charity email programs often because we all just build bits on top of other bits is to rip it up and start again but we know that that isn't feasible for a lot of us and so what do you do if you want to start taking kind of action to help your email marketing program, raise more money, increase visitors, increase regular givers, you know, whatever your goals might be. I'd love you to pick one upcoming event, kind of campaign or activity and make the primary goal either kind of that your core promotion 
is via email to existing subscribers. How does that change how you plan your comms and a kind of multi-channel marketing campaign? So it's basically about taking email as a kind of a nice to have when we've time, got time bottom of the list thing to a core thing. One of the brilliant things about email is because often it's it's longer, it means that you can also then repurpose a lot of what you've written. And then, you know, secondly, use an upcoming event or kind of any kind of community activation piece that you're doing as an opportunity to grow your email community and collect additional information about them. Start to think about how you can add email into kind of your, your in-person engagements or any virtual events and things that you might do and see how, how that changes your approach to email. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can also always email me, alexmaybelate.uk. I don't, I don't even know if Canva has an X logo for Twitter now, but you can find me um, at Alexandra Fearon. And if you scan that QR code, you can join my email community where every second week I send charity specific um, kind of newsletters, emails about how to send emails that don't suck and to help us kind of build really powerful and kind of integrated marketing communities for the not-for-profit sector. Okay, that's that. I can see a hand raise and some q and I'm just gonna get these up. I'm just having a check of the chat. Okay, so we've got a question in the in the Q and A. So, um, where would be the best place to start with an email audit of the emails that we send? So, I always think that probably the easiest place to start is by looking at your your automations. So, I'd usually do that directly within the platform. Um, I would download. The reports and kind of have them on kind of one side and go through each automation and have like a corresponding kind of like high level plan almost that goes with each one and so you can you know make a note of who you're sending the email from what the frequency is between between emails uh, what triggers those automations and that's kind of the best place to kind of start that automation audit piece and then I think in terms of kind of your general email comms, uh, an audit of that, I think, depends on kind of what your content creation process looks like. Um, again, I'd work as much within the email marketing platform as I, as I could. And for kind of those one-off email sends, I would have a look at how often we're sending them, how long they are, um, which and kind of which are the top performing emails and also you know the ones that aren't doing really well and we can start you can start to kind of make assumptions around what types of content and email your community responds to best um, and then start to decide what to a b test and I think kind of the next step beyond that is looking at how email fits into your broader kind of your your content strategy piece um, and how how you're making sure that um, the content and the stories that you're using is, are kind of flowing between all of the different channels and ultimately what that planning process looks like. Um, but feel free to pop me an email. I think it's always it's easier if you can get more specific. And one of the things that I, I always offer is um, free 30 minute email consultations that are always open to anyone. So um, feel free to book in and we can kind of get more specific. Let's see. Okay, we've got another one. And um, what frequency do you recommend for a business offering? Um, services B2B. So from so there's two parts to this frequency piece of the puzzle. The first is like best practice on email deliverability. And if your emails are 
being opened and are being engaged with it really well, I would say that it's worth sending an email every week. However, the second piece of that puzzle is capacity. And, you know, there's, I don't think there's any point in making a plan where you say we're going to send one email a week and you just don't, you just don't feel like, like that's achievable. So I think, yeah, get, be honest about what your capacity is, but at a minimum, I would say monthly. Um, but if you want to push yourself a little bit, I'd say, I'd say twice a month. But again, that segmentation piece, you know, not everything has to go to everyone. So me, for example, um, also B2B, I, when you sign up to my newsletter, you can choose whether you are a charity, a social enterprise or a business. And so not everyone receives all of my emails, but I send as a business three emails a month, but they go to different segments of my audience. So yeah, that's where segmentation can really be your friend. Any more questions from anyone? I think Emma raised her hand. Emma G. We can view that. No. I, I do have a question though, Alex. I'm gonna take this opportunity because I never I can never ask. Um so firstly, um how do you work because we, most people here are fundraisers so how do you do this how do you work effectively and how do you communicate the, your needs to the marketing team because i would guess this is a joint effort absolutely so one of the things that i i talk about in nearly every kind of piece of training or talk that i do is that for email to work we really need to look at breaking down silos and I know that, that it is a focus for us as a sector um, but in terms of kind of expressing those those needs with your marketers I think one of the easiest places to start with is to kind of go okay these are all key fundraising areas throughout the year and that's kind of where I'll ask specific kind of comms will come from but then to go to marketing and to say but to make this effective this is where we need kind of your creative input. And then you can start to bring in that we know like single topic newsletters do better, like or weekly emails. Um, you can start to feedback, you know, potential do like supporter or donation data that you're collecting back to kind of marketing and to kind of feed into their campaign planning. Um, but ultimately it is a tricky one to answer because it is, I think a lot of it depends on what the existing processes are within your organization and the culture within your organization. Um, but I also, I do think there's, there's a lot to be said for big joint kind of planning meetings so that everyone can get a full picture of, you know, what let's say a six or 12 month experience as an email subscriber would be for someone kind of in your email community. That's that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Um, if there are no more questions, you well, you can still uh, contact Alex. She shared um, her contact details with everyone, and I will share them as well on a follow up email. So yeah, um, just to say thank you very much, Alex. Um, sorry, I'm going to put my camera on. <laughs> uh, just a video. There. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you, Alex, for this really interesting um, presentation on the impact of our well-crafted email marketing plan and how this can really support your fundraising efforts. I'm sure many attendees took some notes and will hopefully apply them to their work. Um, just a quick reminder to please complete our post-event evaluation. I will share the link on the chat tab now with you. Um, I'll do that up now before you leave. Um, yeah, it would be great to have your feedback um, to help us understand what worked, what needs to be improved for future reference. Um, this session will be also available in YouTube in case you would like to rewatch it or share it with um, your network. Um, and I also will share the link 
to watch all of our sessions via email. Finally, um, big thanks to the Arts Council England that fund this program, to the Cultural Sector Network that supports the program as Libera Partners along with Young Arts Fundraisers. And again, Alex, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so have much. A, thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Bye. Bye.